If you look on the bottom of your first page, you'll see a, a quote from this book here that we, we read last night. And in this quote on Millerite history, the author points out that the fundamental approach to Bible prophecy that the Millerites had was that there were two desolating powers. Paganism, the desolating power outside the church, followed by papalism, the desolating power inside the church. And in Daniel 8, Daniel 11, and Daniel 12, you'll see um, t these two desolating powers represented by the daily and the abomination of desolation. But in Daniel 8, the abomination of desolation is called the transgression of desolation. But in Daniel 11.31 and Daniel 12.11, when it's, it speaks about the abomination that maketh desolate, that's the abomination of desolation, and the pioneers taught that the abomination, correctly taught, that the abomination of desolation in Daniel 12.11, Daniel 11.31, and the transgression of desolation in Daniel 8. Um, 13 is the papacy. Okay, that's, that's standard, correct Adventist understanding. In relation to the daily, the daily is paganism. The abomination or transgression of desolation in the book of Daniel is papalism. Everyone understand that? Okay, that's, let's start our notes then. On the top of the page, Matthew 24, 15 and 16. When ye therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now Sister White says Seventh-day Adventists are supposed to be studying the books of Daniel and Revelation. She says Daniel and Revelation are the same book. And here Jesus is identifying a specific truth in the book of Daniel that we're to understand because Jesus is the author of the prophetic word and as the author of the prophetic word, he has taught in his prophetic word that all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. So if there was ever a generation that needs to know what the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel is, it's us. Okay, you follow the logic there? So when Sister White comments on Matthew 24, 15 in the Great Controversy, who does she say the abomination of desolation is? She says it's pagan Rome. Okay, but the pioneers taught the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel was the papacy. Okay, so I'm purposely putting them at odd. There's a way that they're, they're in agreement with each other, but I want you to at least think it through. Um, in, after that quote, you have um, Daniel 12, verse 11 and 12, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there should be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. This, the daily here is paganism. The abomination that maketh less desolate is papalism. Same with Daniel 11, 31. The daily is paganism. The abomination that maketh desolate is papalism. I'm not dealing with the fact that we teach differently at the end of the world about the daily. We do teach the same about the abomination of desolation. I'm not dealing with that fact right now. And then in verses 11 through 13 of Daniel 8, you see this same relationship. The last verse there saying, Then I heard one saint speaking. There's three verses there, and I'm going to read verse 13. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation? Um, so, now let's see if we can bring these concepts together because Sister White identifies the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, 15 as the time when pagan Rome came and placed its standards in the sacred precincts surrounding the temple um, and it was a sign that the Christians in Jerusalem were to flee and the Romans mysteriously withdrew for a period of time and when they re returned they destroyed Jerusalem AD 70 but not a Christian was lost in that destruction and that was the abomination of desolation that Jesus predicted here in Matthew 24 15 but the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel represents the papacy so how do you blend these you see the disagreement that I'm identifying how do you blend them well 
Probably the most important passage in the book of Daniel on this subject for the Millerites is Daniel 9, 26 and 27. Two desolating powers. And we're going to look at this a little bit this evening, but not, not as deeply as we could. Verse 26 says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come to shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of there shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. This is the verse that the Millerites go to to justify two desolating powers. To the end of the war, Two desolations. And that doesn't say that a desolation is determined. It says desolation. So the Millerites will tell you that this is the verse that Jesus is referring to. This is the abomination of desolation. Okay. And, and in reality when you see what Jesus is using the abomination of desolation for in Matthew 24, 15. He's using it as a, as a sign to flee. And pagan Rome fulfilled that sign when they placed the standards of their authority in the sacred precincts of the temple. It was a sign for the Christians to flee. But the papacy did the very same thing. If you read Great Controversy, page 49 and 50, at the time period when the, the papal church was coming into control just prior to 538, the true Christians in that history realized that they had to separate from the papacy. And the reason they had to separate is because the papacy had come into the sacred, sacred precincts of the Christian church and placed the banner of its spiritual authority there and that was the sign for them to separate. And if, you, if you're not thinking that the papacy was in the sacred precincts, go to, to Revelation 11 verse 2. I could have put this in the notes, but I never thought about it. Revelation 11 verse 2 says, But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city. What's the holy city in the scriptures? Jerusalem shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And that forty-two months is what? It's the 1260 years of papal rule. They were treading down Jerusalem. They, the abomination of desolation um, is a sign that tells God's people it's time to flee. And the, the Christians in Jerusalem fled when pagan Rome fulfilled the abomination of desolations, desolation. And the Christians fled out of the church um, just prior to 538 when they realized that Rome had taken control of the sacred precincts of the Christian church. And that's why Sister White uses two times Matthew 24, 15 to say when the Sunday law comes, that is what? A sign for God's people to flee the cities. Okay, it's a, it's a sign to flee. So the abomination of desolation in the book of Daniel is first off, when Jesus is using it, he's using it as a general symbol. Okay, for both desolating powers. In fact, for three, for three desolating powers because pagan Rome and papal Rome go to illustrate modern Rome and there's an abomination of desolation in modern Rome with the Sunday law. So but Jesus, when Jesus is using that term, he's using it as a general term. But in, in a specific sense, in the book of Daniel, the daily and the abomination of desolation is dealing with paganism and papalism. Now if you go to page 2, <clears throat> we read verse 26 just a second ago but in Daniel 9.26 on the top of page 2 of your notes it says and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end of there shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war desolations are determined and this is the verse the pioneers used to identify the two desolating powers and in this verse you can see both desolating powers the first desolating power is paganism and paganism came and in AD 70 destroyed the sanctuary in the city did it not and that's what it says here the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary but it goes on, it says, and the end thereof shall be with the flood. And the flood is the second desolating power. In, in Revelation 12, verse 3, which is in your notes, 
You can read all the way through verse 9, but I'm just starting in verse 3. It says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And Revelation 12 is telling us about the persecution that the dragon accomplished against Christ when he was born and while he was on earth. And Sister White comments on this in the Great Controversy 438. And I'm just going to pick up the last sentence of her comment there. She says, Thus while the dragon, and she's talking about the dragon in Revelation 12, you can read it. Thus while the, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is in a secondary sense a symbol of pagan Rome. So in Revelation 12, paganism is represented by the dragon that's waiting to persecute the man-child that's born and caught up to heaven. But Revelation 12 continues on. If you notice verse 15 in your notes, it says, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. The flood here at the end of Revelation 12 that's being cast out to destroy the woman, in verse 6 and verse 14, it's described as the 1260 years of papal rule. The flood here is the symbol of the desolating power of the papacy. In the first part of Revelation 12, the dragon is paganism. And the second part of Revelation 12, the flood represents papacy. And that's why when you go to Daniel 9.26, and it says, The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who destroyed the city and the sanctuary? Pagan Rome. And, unto the end of the, and the end thereof shall be with the flood... Books of Daniel and Revelation agree with one another. What's the flood represent? The papacy. Okay. There's a, there's a, a two-step desolation that takes place in this history. The first begins with paganism. The second with papacy. All right. Am I losing you? You don't know where I'm going yet, so you're probably thinking, why is he telling us these things? But it, we'll, we'll finish this up and you'll see where we're going in just a moment. In verses, verse 26 and 27... You can break them out, break them up in verse 26 into an A and then a B. And then verse 27 into an A and a B. And I have that for you done, done on your notes under determined. In the first part of verse 26, the first part speaking about Christ. The second part speaking about the des this desolating power. And then this first part of verse 27, it's information about Christ second part about this desolating power. Notice verse 26 that I have broken up underneath determined part A. The first part of the verse says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself. B, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with the flood and under the end of the war desolations are determined. Now verse 27, first part says, and he Christ shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now part B of that verse says and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and now here's the thing that you need to see here I believe and that determined there's something determined okay and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now not all but many Bibles will have a marginal reference for this word desolate. And it will say, desolator. Okay? What, what part B of, of verse 27 is saying is that the, the consummation, at the end, the end of what? Well, in verse 26 in part B, it says, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So there's a war under discussion. And verse 27 is, is continuing that thought in part B. It's saying, even unto the consummation, the consummation of this war. What war? The war that's carried out by paganism and papalism against the sanctuary and the host. Until the end of that war, in verse 27, there's something determined. And what is determined is going to be poured upon the desolator. Okay, and the desolator at the end of the war is the pap papacy. The papacy is the second desolating power. And at the end of whatever this war is, desolation is going to be poured upon the desolator. You, if you have the marginal reference, that's generally what it will say. Now, last night, for s most of you weren't here last night, and I don't think I made enough notes. If, if there are husbands and wives or whatever that have two sets of notes, you might send them back to the back. Did, did, we're out of notes probably, right? 
Okay, we tried. Last night, what we dealt with. <coughs> Last night, what we dealt with a little bit was the 225-20 time prophecies. Okay, over here on this pro chart that Sister White says was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered, you see right up here in the right-hand corner, the 25-20 time prophecy. On... On give it, give it to the brother back there. Leo, Leo set through this presentation before. Are we all set. Okay. Last night we started, uh, we were dealing with the 2520 time prophecy. This is the 1843 chart which Sister White says is directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered. A lot of people say there's a bunch of mistakes on this chart and they use her passage in early writings, page 74, to say she says there was a bunch of mistakes on this chart. But if you read that very carefully, she says there was a mistake singular in some of the figures. And the mistake was the missing year and it represented in this figure and this figure. And on page 238 of early writings, the same book, she explains that it was, that was the only mistake. The only mistake that you can use the spirit of prophecy to identify on this chart is a singular mistake that comes out in 1843 on these two prophecies, okay? And in 1850, when they printed this chart at the direction of the Lord, and Sister White says of this chart, the 1850 no chart, I saw that God was in the publishment of this chart and she also says that these two charts were ordered of God. In another place she said God was in the production of this chart. Okay, so she puts the same endorsement on this chart as this chart and down here in the lower right hand corner you'll see the 2520 is there and if you're wondering why it's, why it's obscured down here is because from 1844 to 1846 is the time period where the phenomenon took place that they were searching out the pillars when Sister White couldn't understand the Bible and when they reached an impasse where they couldn't understand something then she'd be taken off in vision and be given light. And in that time period, prior to 1850, according to the Spirit of Prophecy, they established the pillars. So on this chart you have these truths which are, Sister White identifies as the foundational truths. And on this chart you have the foundational tru truths but you also have here the pillars. The three angels message, the law of God, the Sabbath, the sanctuary. And just by the design of the chart some of these truths are down here in this lower right hand corner but they're there. So on both these charts you have the 2520. But the pioneers, they saw both 2520s. They saw the the 2520 against the northern kingdom, they saw it against the southern kingdom, but Miller chose to apply it against the southern kingdom. In 1856, Hiram Medzen says, I believe Miller's wrong, and he has a series of articles that we handed out last night. There's still a couple of those articles up here, where he says it should have been applied against the northern kingdom. And here's what Hiram Medzen says. He says, the southern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes, Ephraim, was carried into captivity in 723. And if you go 2,520 years in the future, that ends in 1798. And perhaps his strongest argument for that being the correct 2,520 is he says if you apply the 2,520 against the northern kingdom, then what you do, if you go to the very center of that history, you come to 538 and you're producing two time periods of 1,260 years that God's people were scattered, trampled down, the first is by the pagan powers, the second is by the papal powers, the two desolating powers, which is the very fundamental approach by the Millerites to Bible prophecy. So this is why Hiram R. Edson was saying that Miller was incorrect, and Miller said you should start the 2520 against the southern kingdom in 677, and when you do that, of course, they weren't on the chart, they hadn't corrected 1843 and 1844 yet, so he has the conclusion of the 2520 on the chart, 1843, but in reality, it ends in 1844. Last night, we looked at the time prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7, that was given in 742, where in verse 8, it says that in 
within, it says within, within 65 years, the northern kingdom would no longer be a kingdom. And that prophecy was given in 742. And 19 years later, in 723, the northern kingdom was scattered to the nations. And it was gone. And that prophecy was fulfilled. But this 65-year prophecy of Isaiah 7 verse 8, it happens to end on the very year that the southern kingdom begins its 2520. There's just, there's just no way that that's an accident. Isaiah is marking both starting points for both of these time prophecies. The Millerites did not understand that you were supposed to look at both these time prophecies as valid. They were trying to figure out which one is correct. Miller chose the southern one and then you know, 10 years later or so, Hiram Enzen says, no, it should be the northern one. And then it goes into oblivion in terms of Advent history. And when, when it begins to be recognized here at the end of the world, then, it's a, then we understand that we're supposed to look at both of them. Because when we look at both of them, we realize that the one concludes in 1798, which is the time of the end for the Millerites. The other concludes in 1844. And it identifies this 46-year time period of Millerite history in agreement with John 2.20 where the Pharisees protested Christ that it took 46 years to build the temple. Okay? And in, in this history from 1798 to 1844, the temple of the Millerites was erected because Sister White says on 1844, the messenger of the covenant and fulfillment of Malachi came suddenly to his temple and he had to build his temple before he could suddenly come to it. Okay? There's a lot of pr pr prophecy that you can bring to bear on this. So... If you go to your notes, the bottom of page 2, Daniel 11.36 says, And the king shall do according to his will. And we discussed this a little bit last night. This is probably one of the top three. I don't know if the other, what the other two would be. This may be the most argued about verse in Advent history. All right. In the beginning, the Millerites, they believed that the king of verse 36 was the papacy. But in the 1870-18 time period, 1870-1880 time period, Uriah Smith began to teach that the king in this verse was Turkey. And there's been a controversy for, there was a controversy probably for, till at least World War II over that. And now in Adventism today, almost everyone admits that the pioneer, were, were, pioneers were correct on this, that the king in verse 36 of Daniel 11 is the papacy. There's not very many people that are prepared to try to defend that it's Turkey. Okay? But this is, a, this is a big time verse in Advent history. And it says, And he, the king, the papacy, shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and he shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till when? Till the indignation be accomplished. Now last night we looked at the fact that there's two indignations in the word of God. One indignation is the indignation against the lost during the seven last plagues. But the other indignation that the Bible speaks about is the indignation that God carried out against his people for breaking the covenant. These 2520 time prophecies are God's indignation. We read some quotes last night from the Bible where that's what they're, the scattering of God's people is called God's indignation. So in verse 36, we're seeing the history of the papacy. And verse 36 of Daniel 11 says that the papacy shall prosper until the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done. And what we're saying here is the papacy was going to prosper until the indignation finished in 1798. And did not the papacy prosper until 1798? And this is when this indignation finished. So what I'm wanting you to see is that the end of this time prophecy is specifically identified by Daniel. Okay, and now notice what it says in verse 36. It says, the papacy shall prosper until this 2520 indignation is accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Now what's determined for the papacy? If you, you look right up above that. In verse 27 of Daniel 9, it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. The consummation of what? Of this war. What war? The war where pagan Rome and papal Rome tramples down the sanctuary and the host for 2,520 years. Okay. 
make it desolate even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolator. There was something determined for the, the second desolating power. And it, it, like I said, if you have the correct Bible, it will in the margin it will say desolation is going to be poured upon the desolator. And the, this verse, Daniel 9.27 and Daniel 11.36, is saying that the papacy, the second desolating power, is going to prosper until the end of this 2520 time prophecy. And then desolation is going to be poured upon him. And sure enough, the deadly wound was delivered there. So what I want you to see is it's not simply that William Miller found that Moses had set forth the 2520 years in Leviticus 26 but also Isaiah marks both the starting points for both of these prophecies and Daniel marks the ending point for this prophecy but notice notice now if you don't if you're not familiar with this and in this you could spend a couple hours on maybe more um, in Daniel chapter 8 you'll find the word vision ten times. But it's two different Hebrew words. Okay, one's mare and one's chauzon. And mare means appearance. In fact, there's one place where the word mare that is translated in Daniel 8 as vision. And if you're not familiar with this, verse 1 you'll see the word vision in Daniel 8. Verse 2 you'll see the word vision twice. In verse 13 you'll see it for the fourth time. In verse 15 you'll see it for the fifth time. In verse 17 for the sixth time. Verse 16, uh, there was one I passed for the seventh time. Twice in verse 26 for the nine times. And in the verse 27 you see vision for the tenth time. But it's two different Hebrew words. And mare is one of those words. And the Hebrew definition of mare is appearance. Okay, and one time in verse, where is it? In verse 15, the very last phrase in verse 15 of Daniel 8, he says, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. That's the word mare, only here it doesn't get translated as vision. But mare means an appearance, whereas the other word, vision, is chauzon, and it means the complete vision. Okay, chauzon means the whole story of Daniel 8, where mare is talking about a singular point in the vision. Okay, there's a distinction. And when, when you make this distinction, there's all kinds of lights that come on in Daniel 8. We just wanted to make one point. We haven't got time to turn those lights on if you're not familiar with them. In verse 26, you see both Mare and Chao Zone. The first vision in verse 26 is Mare, meaning appearance, and the second is Chao Zone. But verse 26 will let us know what the Mare vision is. Because in verse 26 it, it says, And the Mare vision of the evening and morning which was told is true. Now this Hebrew expression that's translated as evening and morning in this verse, Daniel uses the identical word in verse 14. In verse 14 of Daniel 8, it says, Unto 2,300 days. In verse 14, this word that's translated days is the same word as verse 26 that's translated evening and mornings. Okay, they're the same word. Just in verse 14 they say days. And in verse 26 they say evening and morning. So verse 26, what it's saying, that the Mare vision of the evening and morning is true. The Mare vision is the vision of the 2300 days. Okay, the, the Hebrew makes that clear. You with me? Because we're not talking about the Chao Zone vision here. We're talking about the Mari vision and just for a moment. In Daniel 8, 14, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That's the Mare vision because on October 22nd, 1844, the messenger of the covenant was going to suddenly come to his temple and Christ was going to appear in the most holy place. It's a point in time. It's not the complete vision. All right? You with me? But you don't know where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> okay, so let's, um, let's start here in verse 15. You have it in your notes. You can read it from your Bible. Daniel 8. We're in Daniel 8. After the, the 2300 year vision, 2300 years of verse 14, it says this. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for meaning, then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard the man's voice between the banks of the Uli, which called and said, Gabriel. 
Make this man to understand the vision. <clears throat> and that's the Mare vision. Now there's two visions in Daniel 8. If we could read the Hebrew and it was written in Hebrew, it would be totally different. And we'd realize that Gabriel was given the command to make Daniel understand the Mare vision. He wasn't commanded to make him understand the child's own vision. And the Mare vision is the vision of the 2300 days. Okay, so you have to see that to get this point we're leading to. And when we get this point, then we'll move off of this. Everyone with me? So it says, And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, and he touched me and set me upright. Now what, what has Gabriel been told by God to do? Make him understand the vision of the 2300 days. Now notice the next verse. And he said, Behold, I will now, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. What does that mean? No, no, no. What does it mean, the last end of the indignation? Why doesn't it just say the end of the indignation? There has to be a first if there's a last. Isn't that kind of awkward? I'm going to make you understand what will be in the last end of the indignation? Why doesn't he just say, I'll make you understand what will be in the end of the indignation? He doesn't say that. The last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. And, and sure enough, this indignation of this 2520, it ends last. And it ends on October 22nd, 1844. The same point in time that the 2300 year prophecy ends. So I want you to see that it's not simply Moses that sets forth these 25-20 time prophecy. Isaiah gives a second testimony because he marks both the beginning points and the prophet Daniel identifies both the ending points specifically. Now, <clears throat> the argument in Adventism today, and if you're not aware of it, there is an argument twofold. I've said this before. First, the first argument is <clears throat> the pioneers were wrong on the 25-20. They applied it on, on the southern kingdom beginning in 677. And they're wrong. The other argument is, is that those of us that are looking at the 2520 at the end of the world and we're applying it to both the northern and the southern kingdom, we're even wronger than they were uh, because <laughs> we're building on a false premise and the pioneers didn't buy both of them at the same time. So you have a twofold argument going on here and the whole argument is based upon the Hebrew in Leviticus 26 because where it says seven times there, it's not the same Hebrew word that's translated as times in the book of Daniel, where we have times, times, and dividing a time. In the book of Daniel, it's real easy to see the numerical value in the times, times, and dividing in time. But the theologians that know the Hebrew, they can look at Leviticus 26, and they can argue that that Hebrew word is not justified in putting a numerical value to it. Okay? <laughs> now we told you right at the beginning that when it comes to accepting the foundations, if you're going to reject the foundations, you're going to reject the spirit of prophecy. You can't separate them. Like, I mean, for, for a simple-minded person like me, where I, where I get locked into this, is I see that inspiration says that this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered, and that inspiration says that God was in the publishment of this chart, and if it's good enough for one, it's good enough for another, and I saw that there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. For me... That seems like the Lord has put his endorsement on the truths represented on those charts, so I don't have to go much further. But, you see under your notes where it says a kind, a cow, and a year? This is the story of Pharaoh's dream. Verses 25 through 27 of Genesis 41 says this, And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kine, and a kine is a cow, right? You all know this story, right? The seven good kine are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one, and the seven thin and ill-favored kine that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. Now, brothers and sisters, I would like the Hebrew experts to show me 
what kind of numerical value is associated with a cow and an ear of corn? Because the prophet here has just put his seal of approval that these seven cows represent seven years and seven ears of corn represent seven years. So the words don't necessarily have to possess a numerical content if there's a prophet that places their seal of approval on it. Now, what about the baker? A basket and a day. You remember that story? You remember that dream? Genesis 40, 18. And Joseph answered and said, this is in the interpretation of there, thereof. The three baskets are three days. You think there's some kind of numerical content in the word basket? See, it's not simply whether it possesses the numerical content. If a prophet's put their seal of approval on it, then it's good enough for me. I hope it's good enough for you. And Sister White says, you have it on the bottom of your page, concerning this chart here, I've seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and that it should not be altered. And the first time she wrote that statement was in Spalding McGann, page 1. And she says, I saw that the old chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered except by inspiration. You have that in your notes from the first night. It was qualified. This chart could be altered by e inspiration. And after the p pillars of Adventism were established, then the Lord opened Ellen White's mind to the Bible. Before that time, her mind had been locked. She tells this story. Once the pillars were identified and established, her mind was opened, and then she re received instruction to tell her husband to produce this chart. And he hired Brother Nichols to do so. And here's the quote on this chart on the bottom of the page. I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. I saw that there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. And if this chart is designed for God's people, if it's sufficient for one, it is for another. And if one needed a new chart painted on a larger scale, all need it just as much. And the 2520 is on both those charts. And both those charts have been put the seal of approval on them by a prophet. So the argument of the Hebrew in Leviticus 26 is in fulfillment of Jeremiah 6.16 when there's a move to return to the old path of Adventism and there's a group of people in Adventism that say what? We will not walk therein. Okay? So, what we're saying here is this. 1798-1844 that these two end terminus points for these two prophecies are the bookends of the reform movement of the Millerites. And that 1798 comes at the conclusion of a 2520 time prophecy and 1844 comes at a conclusion of a 2520 time prophecy. We're going to spend this evening and tomorrow morning the first presentation looking at this. But on page 4, it says this. In the history of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, God, sp God speaks to the people of today. The condemnation that will fall upon the inhabitants of the earth in this day will be because of their, re their rejection of light. Our condemnation in the judgment will not result from the fact that we have lived in error but from the fact that we've neglected heaven-sent opportunities for discovering truth. The means of becoming conversant with truth are within the reach of all, but like the indulgent selfish king, we give more attention to the things that charm the ear and please the eye and gratify the palate than to the things that enrich the mind, the divine treasures of truth. It is through the truth that we may answer the great question, what must I do to be saved? We've been dealing with the principle that's underneath that from 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 11 and 12 now all these things happen unto them for examples and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come wherefore let him that think he standeth take heed lest he fall and we've been looking at type and I type illustration from God's word throughout the week and sister white in the next, next quote tells us that 
Belshazzar and Nebuchadnezzar. The story of Belshazzar in chapter 5 and Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 are governed by the, the law of type and or type. She says in Prophets and King, the last ruler of Babylon, as in type to its first, had come the sentence of the divine watcher, O king, to thee it is spoken. Thy kingdom is departed from thee. And then in Daniel 5, verses 5 and 6, we have a divine pronouncement. Now some of you, most of you, or at least a good part of you, haven't been here all week long. So I'm going to try catching you up so you can get this next point. <clears throat> the history of Nimrod can be illustrated upon the three-step process of the Holy Spirit. The three-step three work of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. That is also illustrated in the sanctuary, the courtyard, conviction of sin, the holy place, righteousness, the most holy place, judgment. The first angel's message is a message that convicts of sin. In the second angel's message in the summer of 1844, righteousness was manifested in the midnight cry and it reached its conclusion when judgment began. The reform movements of the Bible are based upon this three-step process, process, conviction of sin, demonstration of righteousness, concluding with judgment. The first message that convicts of sin is a warning message, and when the warning message gets rejected, and in each of these histories there's a group that rejects it, when it gets rejected, then there follows a divine pronouncement identifying that the message has been rejected. And then judgment comes. And we looked at the fact that Sister White says that Nimrod, remember Nimrod, Babel, first mention of Babylon in the Bible, Nimrod had a warning message, according to Sister White in Patriarchs and Prophets, that was given to him by Noah and Shem. But he rejected the warning message, Nimrod did, and then in Genesis, the Lord comes down and he gives a divine pronouncement that nothing will be restrained from them that they've imagined to do. And this imagination takes us back to the flood where the people of the Antiluvian world were judged because their imagination was evil continually. So Noah gives Nimrod a warning message. He rejects it. Then there's a divine pronouncement. The Lord comes down. He says, nothing will be restrained from them. And then it's followed with judgment. That's the process. We went through this this week. A warning message that's rejected, followed by a divine pronouncement that the warning has been rejected, followed by judgment. This is the three angels' message. All right, The warning message of the Millerites. The first angels' message, it was rejected by the Protestants. Beginning in June of 1842 and in the summer of 1844, you have the divine pronouncement, Babylon has fallen. And it concludes with judgment. It's always the same. In the story of Belshazzar, you have the same, the same illustration. That's what we're going to look at. In verses 5 and 6 of Daniel chapter 5, it says, In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that his joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. The divine pronouncement... And by the way, what we're going to try to show you here tonight is that the story of the Millerites here from 1798 to 1844, it's the story of Belshazzar. Okay. The divine pronouncement in the history of the Millerites was the summer of 1844 when the second angel's message was proclaimed, Babylon has fallen. All right, that was the divine pronouncement. But for... Belshazzar, the divine pronouncement, was many, many tekel eupharsin, right? Correct? That's an abbreviation. You, you have it in your notes here in just a second. So, on, still on page four, we have the, the context of the story of Belshazzar that we need to put in the record. Belshazzar sees the handwriting on the wall. He wants to figure out what it is and he ends up having the prophet Daniel stand in front of him and explain it to him. So we're, we're taking this up beginning in verse 18. It says, O thou king, this is Daniel, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he slew, whom 
he would slew, whom he would he slew, and whom he would he kept alive, and whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from the kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beast, and his dwelling place was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in he- the, heaven, the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. And now his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this. There. The warning message for Belshazzar was the story of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4. Okay. The warning message for the Millerites was the first angel's message. And Nebuchadnezzar is the first angel's message for Belshazzar. So you're down here now at the divine pronouncement. Many, many tekel you farsen. It's all over for Belshazzar. He's, he, it's, it's over with. This is the divine pronouncement. And, the, and it says in the very night he was slain. Judgment came in that very night. And of course that's what happened in the midnight cry in the Millerites. And too much judgment arrived. The very night he was slain. But Daniel comes in and he says, You had a warning message and your warning message was the story of Nebuchadnezzar, though you knew all this. So continuing on, next page, but has lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. This is the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar did. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver, of gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and who, whose are all thy ways, has thou not glorified? Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this was the writing. Many, many tell you far sent. Notice what Sister White says from Testimonies to Ministers, page 436. Belshazzar, awed by this representation of God's power, showing that they had a, a witness, though they knew it not, had had great opportunities of knowing the works of the living God and his power and of doing his will. He had been privileged with much light. His grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, had been warned of his danger in forgetting God and glorifying himself. Belshazzar had a knowledge of his banishment from the society of men in his association with the beast of the fields. And these facts, which ought to have been a lesson to him, he disregarded as if they'd never occurred. And he went on repeating the sins of his grandfather. He dared to commit the crimes which brought God's judgment upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was condemned, not alone that he was doing wickedly, but that he had not availed himself of opportunities and capabilities, if cultivated, of being right. And then we have the divine pronouncement. And we looked at the divine divine pronouncement last night. The divine pronouncement was also monetary coins of the time, which adds up to 2520. A many is a thousand, a many is a thousand, a tekel is 20, and a eupharson is 500. So in the divine pronouncement, we see the 2520 in the story of Belshazzar. The divine pronouncement here of many, many tekel you farsen is 2520 and then in your notes this is Belshazzar's judgment. In the, that very, in that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. The, and here's what I want you to see. The, all these histories are the same. There's a warning message for the Millerites. It was the first angel's message. It was rejected. For Belshazzar the warning message was the story of Nebuchadnezzar. It was rejected. After it was rejected, there's a divine pronouncement in the summer of 1844. Babylon has fallen. When we understand that the divine pronouncement for the Millerites, the second angel's message, is Babylon has fallen, are we stretching scripture to see a connection between this pronouncement, Babylon has fallen, and the story of Belshazzar, where Babylon fell? I mean, this is, this is tied together very very securely, all right? The divine pronouncement in the summer of 1844, Babylon has fallen, is the divine pronouncement in the story of Belshazzar of many, many Tokyo Farson, which adds up to 2520. And on that very night he was slain. And what we're saying is, is at the conclusion of the midnight cry, judgment began. This is the judgment of 1844. This is the judgment of Belshazzar. And both those judgments arrive at the conclusion of a 2520. And you don't have to say anything about the Hebrew of Leviticus 26 to see that. (laughs) 
Selected Messages, Book 3, page 338. Never are we absent from the mind of God. God is our joy and our salvation. Each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours, so that their prophesying is enforced for us. The story of Belshazzar is more for us than for Belshazzar. Next page. Um, in the middle of the page it says, Advancing in Holiness. <coughs> Perceptions are a funny thing. <laughs> Some people can set into set in a, a meeting like this and consider the prophecies that are being discussed. And, and I've had it, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, I've had it happen over and over and over again. doesn't even matter about sex. I've had it happen with men and women. I've watched people sit in presentations like this, and at the end of the presentations, they'll come up to me with tears streaming down their face, saying, I get it. Probation's about to close. The Lord's returning. What must I do to be saved? And the only reason they do that, from my understanding, is because they understood that prophetic message was the voice of God speaking to their soul. But another, another, another group of people in Adventism, they can sit into meetings where these kind of things are being discussed, and they'll say, you know, I just don't hear Jesus in this. I don't hear Jesus in this. Even though Sister White says things like this, she says it was the voice of Christ that spoke through patriarchs and prophets from the days of Adam until the closing scenes of time. The closing scenes of time is our day and age, so what, what she's saying is, it's the voice of Christ that's in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And if you're studying it, it's his voice. So notice this next quote, because this is going to talk about the church, but I think it can apply to us individually. The Bible was designed to be a guide to all who wish to become acquainted with the will of their maker. God gave to men the sure word of prophecy. Angels and even Christ himself came to make known to Daniel and John the things that must shortly come to pass. Those important matters that concern our salvation were not left involved in mystery. They were not revealed in such a way as to perplex and mislead the honest seeker after truth. Said the Lord by the prophet Habakkuk, Write the vision and make it plain that he may run that readeth it. The word of God is made is plain to all who study it with a prayerful heart. Every truly honest soul will come to the light of truth. Light is sown for the righteous. Now notice this last sentence. Because I think you can put individual in there where it says church. And no church or individual can advance in holiness unless its members, or him or herself, are earnestly seeking for truth as for hid treasure. <laughs> A lot of wonderful truths in the Word of God. And you can go buy the, and go to the Adventist bookstore on Monday and get the, the book, The 27 Fundamental Beliefs, whatever the title of it is. That may not be the right title. And you can learn all the, the basic truths of Ad, Adventism and get them memorized, know how to defend them from the Word of God. But if you're not seeking for truth in God's Word as if you're looking for hidden treasures, you can't advance in holiness. And this is the remedy for a Laodicean. As Laodiceans, we're lost. We're about to be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. If you can't tell probation's about to close, you need to go sit in front of your TV a little bit more and read your newspapers and your magazines and listen to your radio. It's easy to see that probation's about to close. People in the world are witnessing it. Why, why aren't Adventists witnessing it? The only way the Lord's going to awaken and prepare Adventists that are in a Laodicean condition to be among the 144,000, there's only one way. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. But how do you get a Laodicean to study God's word? We don't want to study God's word. We know the 27 fundamentals. Prophecy. If you ever fall in love, with study and prophecy, you get drawn into a study where you begin to consume the Word of God. And the Word of God never comes back void. And the Word of God is full of power, life-changing power. 
That's why Sister White says, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are understood as they should be, there will be seen among us a great revival. And a revival means a renewal of spiritual death. Brothers and sisters, at the end of the world, it's about time that we understood that there is a purpose for God drawing us into prophetic study. And it's not simply to understand the dates and the past history. It's the process that he awakens Laodicean Christians and empowers them to be changed into his image in time to receive the seal of God rather than the mark of the beast. But I digress. Nebuchadnezzar's warning message. Brothers and sisters, Nebuchadnezzar is Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. That's who Nebuchadnezzar is. Here's Revelation 14, 6 and 7. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue of people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give, him, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. That's Nebuchadnezzar. Why do I say that? Verse 6 is the everlasting gospel. Notice what Sister White says about the everlasting gospel. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 106. The message proclaimed by the angel flying in the midst of heaven is the everlasting gospel. The same gospel that was declared in Eden when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. The everlasting gospel produces two classes of worshipers. The Millerites proclaimed the first angel's message from 1798 to 1844. Did they not? Amen? Amen. Did the Millerites proclaim the everlasting gospel from 1798 to 1844? I see one person shaking their head and very few saying one way or another. Yeah, they proclaimed the first angel's message. And when you get to 1844, you can realize they didn't simply proclaim it. They experienced it. Because the everlasting gospel produces two classes of worshiper. And on October 23rd, 1844, 49,950 Millerites were continuing to pray to the holy place. And Sister White informs us that Satan was answering their prayers. And 50 moved into the most holy place with Christ. And the everlasting gospel had been accomplished in that generation. And there had been enmity put between the seed of Satan and the seed of Christ. And not only did they proclaim the everlasting gospel, they experienced the everlasting gospel. That's the first part of the first angel's message. The second part is this three-step process that's always there. Fear God. The message of the first angel was a fearful message. Read Sister White's writing. She's clear that many of the people who were in the Millerite message meetings were there because they were afraid about what they were hearing. That's why they got shaken out. They didn't get beyond the fear. Fear God and give him glory. There was a message in the Millerite history, in this history from 1798, that said the world was going to end. And it was based upon the year-day principle of Bible prophecy. And nobody was listening too much. But then on August 11th, 1840, when the Ottoman Empire came down, as predicted using the year-day principle of Bible prophecy, then the message got very fearful. The people in the world realized that what they were saying about the end of the world in 1843, well, maybe that'll work because it worked down here on this time prophecy here, it was a fearful message. And then, in the summer of 1844, the Spirit was poured out upon those people in the midnight cry, and they gave glory to God. And that's the first angel's message. Fear God. Give Him glory. And what's the third part? For the hour of His judgment has come. Did the hour of His judgment come on October 22nd, 1844? The Millerites were the messengers of the first angel's message. After October 22nd, 1844, what were they to do? They were to understand the Sabbath, were they not? That's why the last part of verse 7 says, and worship him who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and the things that are therein. The first angel's message of Revelation 14, 6, and 7 is an illustration of the, the history of the Millerites. But it's also an illustration of Nebuchadnezzar. Page 7. Because of time... I'm going to um, point you to these, but tell you what they are. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream about a tree. 
And ultimately, Daniel's going to interpret the dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, he doesn't want to at first, because he, he knows the dream's a hard, hard message for Nebuchadnezzar. And in verse 27, after he's given him the explanation, that's the second part on the top of page 7. It says, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be accepted, acceptable unto him, thee, after he explains the dream, and the, the meaning of the dream, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. You see Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar was given a warning message. Where did, where did his warning message come from? Yeah, but where did it come from? It came from Daniel. That's where our warning message comes from too. And that's where the Millerites' warning message came from. That's where Bill Shazer's warning message came from. And the warning message that Nebuchadnezzar received came from Daniel. But Nebuchadnezzar reject the warning message. Nebuchadnezzar represents a group of people that reject the warning message, does he not? A year later it says, he's walking in his his palace. And he says, isn't this great Babylon that I have made? He's rejected the message, has he not? He forgot the warning message. Daniel said, break off your sins by righteousness and you may not have to go through this. He's been given a warning message, but he rejects it. And what happens? A divine watcher comes down from heaven and gives a divine pronouncement. Doesn't he? At the end of 12 months, he walked in his palace, in the palace of his kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon I built for my hou the, the house of the kingdom by my might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. Nebuchadnezzar? He has a warning message. He rejects it. Then there's a divine pronouncement. And then judgment is executed upon him. And what was his judgment? <laughs> he has to live like an animal for 2,520 days. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar represents someone that rejects the warning message. An everlasting gospel, it manifests two classes of worshipers. One class that rejects the message and ends up praying to Satan in the holy place. And one class that accepts it and moves into the most holy place with Christ. Christ puts enmity between the seed of Satan and the seed of Christ. The everlasting gospel produces two classes of worshipers. And Nebuchadnezzar represents someone that rejects the message, but he also represents someone that receives the message. Because at the end of the 2500, 20 days, his kingdom is restored. And you can see this in the bottom of page 7 from Daniel 4, 34. At the end of 2,520 days, what had happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He'd been humbled into the dust, hadn't he? Could you imagine living for seven years like that? Wow. Especially after you'd been the king of the earth. He'd been humbled into the dust. Notice this next quote. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message and I've answered it is the third angel's message in verity. The prophet declares, I'm on the top of page 8, after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. Brightness, glory, and power are connected with the third angel's message and conviction will follow wherever it is preached in demonstration of the spirit. How will any of our brethren know when this light shall come to the people of God? As yet we certainly have not seen the light that answers to this description. God has light for his people and all who will accept it will see the sinfulness of remaining in luke a lukewarm condition. They will heed the counsel of the true witness when he says, Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and will sup with him and he with me. I, was, I set up the next quote. Here's the quote I wanted to read concerning what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. None but God can subdue the pride of man's heart. 
We cannot save ourselves. We cannot regenerate ourselves. In the heavenly courts, there will be no song sung to me that loved myself and washed myself, redeemed myself. Unto me be glory and honor, blessing and praise. But this is the keynote of the song that is sung by many here in this world. They do not know what it means to be meek and lowly in heart, and they do not know what know this if they can avoid it. And they do not mean to know this if they can avoid it. The whole gospel is comprised in learning of Christ's meekness and low, lowliness. What is justification by faith? Well, it, faith, it's the third angel's message in verity. It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. When men see their own nothingness, they are prepared to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. When they begin to praise and exalt God all day long, then by beholding they are become, becoming changed into the same image. What is regeneration? It is revealing to man what is, what is his own real nature, that in himself he is worthless. These lessons you have never learned. Oh, that you could realize the value of the human soul. This is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar represents two classes of worshipers. He first represents a class that rejects the warning message that came from Daniel. And then he represents the class that has experienced the three angels' message, messages and has experienced justification by faith. And in this sense, Nebuchadnezzar is the first angel's message. And brothers and sisters, Nebuchadnezzar's story in, in Daniel chapter 4, it's the warning message for Belshazzar. What was the warning message for the Millerites? It was the three angels' message. It's the first angels' message. You see, Nebuchadnezzar represents the first angels' message of Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. He illustrates both classes of worshipers. He went through this st the three-step process. He learned how to fear God. And he stood up and he gave him glory at the end of the chapter. Was he not giving him glory? Yeah. His judgment had come. He experienced justification by faith. And he had left recorded in history the warning message for Belshazzar. Belshazzar's warning message was Nebuchadnezzar, but the warning message represented by Nebuchadnezzar, it wasn't complete. It was not complete. It was not finished until Nebuchadnezzar was humbled into the dust and stood up and gave glory to God. Then Nebuchadnezzar's message was complete. It was a warning message for Belshazzar. Do you follow the logic? Can you say amen to that? Because if you say amen to that, then you realize that the warning message for Belshazzar arrived in history at the conclusion of a 2520. Mm. 1798. Belshazzar's story illustrates the history of the Millerites perfectly. And it starts at the conclusion of a 2520. And it ends with the conclusion of a 2520. And the warning message is the identical warning message that the Millerites were confronted with. The first angel's message of Revelation 14. And the divine pronouncement, many, many tekel yafarsin. In the Millerite history, it was Babylon is fallen. We're not done. We're not done. Go to page 9. Type and I type. Where Sister White says, the la To the last ruler of Babylon, as in the type to the first, had come the sentence to the d of the divine watcher, O king, to thee it is spoken, thy kingdom is departed from thee. Their type and I type. We already read that. The divine pronouncement for Belshazzar, many, many, Tekel Yafarsin, in that very night, judgment came to him. It's the way it always is. Warning message rejected, divine pronouncement, judgment. And when judgment came to him, <coughs> it says, in, the night, in that night was Belshazzar under Cyrus, the king of the Chaldeans slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. Was it Darius that came and conquered Babylon? No, it was his general, wasn't it? 
Cyrus. Cyrus is the one that shows up. Sister White says, so prophets and kings, so does history. <clears throat> it was not long before reverses came. Babylon was besieged by Cyrus, nephew of Darius the Mede, and commanding general of the combined armies of the Medes and Persians. But within the seemingly impregnable fortresses, with its massive walls and its gates of brass, protected by the river Euphrates and stocked with provision in abundance, the voluptuous monarch felt safe and passed his time in mirth and revelry. You know what they say, don't you? That even though he diverted the waters, Cyrus, that had not those gates been open, he didn't just have to come down the riverbed. Those, that, that river ran through gates you couldn't get through. It wasn't just the water that kept people out, it was gates. But the promise was the gates were going to be open when he came through. Notice the next quote. But notice in here also in this note, next quote from Isaiah, Isaiah that Cyrus in the Bible is what? He's a type of Christ. Isaiah 44. Thus say, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. Who's God's shepherd? Christ. Cyrus is a type of Christ. And shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed. Who's God's anointed? Christ. Thus saith to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates into Babylon, and the gates shall not be shut. Please take note that in the story of Belshazzar, that the very night that he was slain, that Cyrus comes in through the doors that no man could open. Because on October 22nd, 1844, when judgment arrived, Revelation 3, verse 7 and 8 says this, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, or to the Millerites write, These things saith he that is holy, and he that is true, and he that hath the key, the key of David, that he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. At the end of the Millerite history, Christ moves into the most holy place through the door that no man could open. And at the end of history of Belshazzar, Cyrus, a type of Christ, comes through the doors that no man can open. Brothers and sisters, this is an absolute air type, airtight type of Millerite history. So when the argument in Adventism today is, is that the, the Hebrew in Leviticus 26 doesn't justify 2 or even 1 20, well I'm telling you without Leviticus 26, you can demonstrate that the Millerite history begins at the conclusion of a 2520 and it ends with the arrival of a 2520. You don't need Leviticus 26, but we'll use it. Sister White endorsed it. It's on those charts that are the foundations and pillars of Adventism. And when a prophet puts their endorsement on an understanding of scripture, we should receive it. <clears throat> so, Bring these back with you if you come tomorrow morning. We're going to start right here. At minimum, we're going to take a break. Well, how many are ready to retire for the night? There's one hand. <laughs> Two, if you count mine. Three, four, let's, five. You're not, going to, you're not going to bother me if you raise your hands. How many are ready to be, call, to be done here this evening? Because, okay, there's not enough hands. We'll, we'll take this up very easily. This will flow right into what we start with in the morning. What we're going to start in with, this, with in the morning is this, brothers and sisters. Belshazzar illustrates the history of the Millerites from 1798 to 1844. And inspiration teaches 
that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. Therefore, Belshazzar is illustrating Adventism's reform movement, the reform movement of the 144,000 at the end of the world. And you can demonstrate that the reform movement of the 144,000 at the end of the world begins with the 2520 and ends with the 2520. And it'll be just as clear as this is, if you're seeing it. It's, it's, it's there. And the reason that we are bringing this up is because the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy that teaches that at the end of the world there's going to be a return to the foundations of Adventism. And in that time period the latter rain is going to begin to sprinkle and in that time period the shaking that is always spoken about all the prophets including Ellen White when she speaks about the shaking they're talking about the final shaking of Adventism and the final shaking of Adventism takes place in the time period when God returns his people to the foundational truths, to the old paths. And there's going to be a group in Adventism that says we will not walk therein. So when you get to the point to where the Lord is opening up truths that are confirming the validity of the truths represented on the foundations of Adventism, then you know that you're in the time period when that shaking's going on. But more than that, you know what you know? That the handwriting is on the wall for the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is where the two classes are going to be developed. Because when you get down in this history, this is where the everlasting gospel is accomplished among God's people. Just before the Sunday law. In order that those that succeed in that purification process can carry the final warning message to those people outside of Adventism. Shall we pray? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we wish to be confronted with the experience of being humbled into the dust as was Nebuchadnezzar that you might lift us up and change us into your image, that we might glorify you, that we might be used by you to help finish this work, that we can go home with you and be out of this sinful world. But we know with our hard Laodicean hearts that it's a work that we can't do, that you have to do. So we give you permission to do what it takes in each of our lives to make this happen, make a reality in us. We ask that your Holy Spirit gives us no rest till we come to the foot of the cross and set aside those idols and those things that are preventing us from being used more fully by you. Lord, we thank you for the Sabbath that we can come together and receive a special blessing of knowing that you're, you're here with us in a special way. And as we part, we ask that you would give us traveling mercies and give us the rest we need this evening uh, to wake up refreshed in the morning and uh, receive what you have for us throughout the rest of the Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen.